This video is part of a series of interviews with some of the parachute engineers, scientists, and developers who have been responsible for the most significant and advanced parachute systems of the last half century and was created by the Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio. In June 2017, at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Forum, Charles Lowry, longtime deceleration researcher and member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, interviewed Dick Farhall about his work and accomplishments in the parachute industry. Yes, I'm very pleased to be sitting here with Dick, my friend from way back, and uh, we've worked together and, and been friends for a long time. And uh, Tell us, Dick, uh, where were you born and, and where do you live now? I was born in Horsham in Sussex in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, currently live now in Corona in California, um, not far from where the, uh, our facility is in, in Santa Ana. How did you happen to come to this country? Oh, that is a long story. Um, I was working with General Dynamics, a bit like Dean Wolf, who was on, on earlier on, and I met a young lady who worked in a hotel who checked me in and then checked me out. And uh, we got married. Um, she lived in England for 10 years with me and then uh, getting very homesick and got a transfer through the organizations that we worked with to Irvin's in California and been with Irvin's ever since. So. <laughs> Tell us about your education and uh, where did you go to school? Well, high school was in uh, was in Horsham, so my family never moved at all from from that local area. We were sort of born and bred and stayed in that area. I went to college at Imperial College in London, uh, sort of one of the premier engineering colleges in the United Kingdom. Um, it was uh, a really good experience. You know, got a bachelor's there, um, aeronautical engineering. Uh, quite a lot of hands-on work as well as um, you know the theoretical stuff, uh, more related to supersonic flows and things like that, which was my sort of speciality at the time. And uh, I enjoyed my time there. Good time so, in London. Mm -hmm. So before you got into parachutes, you were into supersonics already. Yes, yes. We um, my first job out of college, first real job out of college, was was with um, Hunting Engineering, which was a major defence company in the UK, and. Um, I started work as a aerodynamicist, a project aerodynamicist there, where we were looking at the high end of the of the speed range and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what to do with certain projects. As a defence contractor, we got involved in certain programs. I ended up on a joint UK-US program back in the late 70s, early 80s, and um, I ended up being project aerodynamicist on that and eventually the chief systems engineer, sort of combining a bit of mm -hmm. analysis and design as well as hands-on wind tunnel and flight testing experience uh, in that in that program. So how did you get into parachutes? Well, that program actually used parachutes. Uh, one of the first things that we had to do was um, was develop trajectory models and simulations for the uh, the flight performance of the tornado aircraft carrying the the, the, pro the products we were making, and um, these were all parachute retarded programs. We were flying very low level, a bit uh, like the Sandia work, mm. where we need to decelerate certain you know systems uh, prior to impact. You know we were flying, you know, very low, or very fast, and uh, uh, we needed to, uh, to deploy these systems and have them land relatively softly. And uh, so I got to touch parachutes from like the first year of working at Huntings and mm -hmm. uh, not building them, designing them, but learning how to use them and what they did and, um, you know, yeah. and, and how effective they could be. So that uh, knowledge transferred into your employment when you came to this country? Huh? Uh, yeah, not directly. Um, the, I didn't come to, to, to become parachute. We really needed to come over because my wife was getting homesick. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, more in more by accident than design getting into the parachute business, but having got my teeth wet in it, you know, and um, mm -hmm. it turned out to be the probably one of the best career moves that I'd ever made. And really enjoyed my time here and loved working with parachutes and doing the the, the things that we get up so, to. So once you got here, how many? What places have you worked? Been oh, employed? Only at Irvin. Okay. Only, at the, but then became Airborne Systems. So uh, we came over in ninety. Mm -hmm. 98, so okay. had 20 years on, on weapon systems programs, and then 20 years over here in so. mm -hmm. Tell us about the best or most notable programs you've worked on, and, uh, and what was your participation in those? 
Best programs. Uh, probably the most interesting ones have been the um, the air launch programs that we've done for the missile defence agency. So they've that they when they first came over here, uh, the day I walked in through the door, working with the team, they said, right, we're working on this program for for MDA, and um, I've seen that through from since since working through the door and seeing it grow from you know sort of a concept to first principles and first testing and now. Uh, as you can see on some of the MDA websites, some of the programs that we are now in the public domain. That uh, so, how are parachutes used in that program? We we are actually presenting the targets for the uh, for the missile defense agencies to to shoot against, and we need to launch them um, uh, from a non land base, and we will then allow the uh, targets to be deployed from the back of a C-17 and then uh, launched uh, towards wherever the interceptors are based and they become the targets. So, so the parachute becomes the means of pulling the uh, tar the uh, payload out of the airplane and then setting it up in an attitude that would... Correct. We, we're getting, it on, getting it on condition to give it a launch conditions. An air um, launch. A, an air launch capability so that we can provide these targets um, uh, as required. In the uh, work that you've been so involved with through your parachute career, what, what were the biggest technical challenges you had to fight? Um, biggest technical challenges uh, overseas on the original defence programs we were trying to accommodate uh, a lot of the weapon systems requirements that uh, were, were a lot of challenges for um, the mission performance that we were required to give from, from there so that in, in prior to the parachute systems some of the other parachute systems that provide challenges, for example, have been the uh, underwater parachutes. We've done some underwater parachutes for um, an overseas company, and they are trying to stop large chips. Um, you know, we're trying to build parachutes that will take hundreds of thousands of tons of load and mm -hmm. slow ships down with underwater parachutes have been quite challenging, and the design of that mm -hmm. has been uh, uh, has been. Pushing the state of the art, shall we say, of, of how we can mm -hmm. uh, we can deploy those systems, both in terms of the concept of operations and in the actual dis the, the design of the parachute systems themselves. How about uh, what's your proudest moment in your career? In something you accomplished? Um, that, that could be broken into a, a, a number of different things. I think for for, for the parachute side of life, um, we, we do a lot of the spin and stall recovery systems. We go around the world talking to. Um, to aircraft companies with spin and stall recovery systems, and you know, there are occasions when people came up to you and say, "Your system saved your saved our lives." You know, we were on a Global Express or a other type of airplane where we were at a deep stall and we needed to use the system. Otherwise, it was, you know, that was the last system of last resort. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's great to be able to talk to those people to say, "Okay, you know, they're standing here because our system worked." <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's really good. It, it, it's impressive it, the systems that they we airborne and the industry have used over the years to you know recover airplanes, save people's lives, and things like that. Just just you know, people don't realise how intimately we're involved in some of these flight test programs, mm -hmm. uh, for, even for a lot of the big commercial aircraft. So in. Uh, in the business that you've been in, uh, how, what people have you most enjoyed working with and, and who do you most admire in the industry? Well, I guess the three, the three key, key players that I've dealt with over my time in the parachute industry have been Ed Vickery, Phil Delegio and Rob Sinclair, all um, valued Kanaki winners. Um, Phil I knew from, from working in England, we'd worked and he was part of the reason why, why I came over here. I was, uh, you know, knew Phil and he gave me the opportunity to come. Ed actually was the person who wrote me the job offer and things like that. So uh, Phil gives you the big the big picture of this is you know what can be done with parachutes and Ed is more of, you know, this is how it's going to be done, you mm. know, and how we need to yep. so I've learned a lot from both of those. And then Rob of course is a great engine all round engineer and, you know, a, a sage person a, you know person to go and talk to uh, advice and talk to. So mm. the, those three um, persons that we've worked in in this industry have been the sort of the key to helping me get through a lot of these issues. Tell us when, uh, compare when you first got in the business, the parachute business, and how you did things and how things were done and versus how they're done today. Well, I, I think there's a lot more analysis, detailed analysis of people understanding much more of the uh, of the physics that are going on behind the, uh, the, the parachute systems themselves. 
if you look at some of the advances in fluid structure interaction and how you can model things compared to how we did years ago. Um, so different. You know, when we were back in the seven, late 70s when we were trying to figure out how parachutes were going to open and it was very rudimentary empirical methods and um, looking at the modeling that we do today of multiple parachutes with all opening at different times in the same you know time space environment it, it's so different to, to what we, we where we were before um, you know it's always good and bad from that you know you can't get lost in the the analysis you've got to turn it into some practicality you know so you've got to still got to have a, a practical side to Understanding what you're seeing from those models, right? You know, um, so the the, the practi practical person, someone, somebody with a, a, a sort of more general knowledge base and experience base, it needs to be there to apply some level of, of confidence to what's coming out of those models. How about innovations that you've seen? Big things that have occurred during your uh, your employment in parachutes that stand out as a, as a great step forward. Well, a lot of the things that we're doing at the moment with some of these new materials, the very um, the flexible composite materials, you know, we can have a step change in um, in, in the mass of a, of a parachute for a particular uh, size or um, configuration. You know, that brings with its its own challenges. It has different characteristics in terms of material properties to the nylons and things that we've used before. So we've got to learn. We're starting from baby steps to build. Um, a knowledge base of these new materials. So whereas we've had nylon and Kevlar, there are new materials in 20 years time, we will probably understand them as much as we understand Kevlar and Vectran these days. But, um, you know, where it's the, the, the early steps, you know, until you make that breakthrough of finding these materials that are, um, that can help you with that design, uh, those designs, it's, um, you know, it, that's been the latest, uh, the latest, how about innovations that you hope occur, that you would like to dream someday that will occur to help you in your job? The one thing that I would really like to see, and I think a lot of people are probably working on it, is is improvements to reefing reefing systems and reefing cutters and things, and uh, you know to be able to have on demand reefing. And you know, at the moment we, we rely so much on very um, uh, you know sort of time de time dependent systems. I think there is going to be a technology breakthrough in there and you can, you know, wirelessly talk to a reefing cutter and say, okay, now I need to disreef and integrate that more at a system level because we're using very discrete components and I think um, that would be something that we would, you know, really like to see as a, as a, as a step forward in, in ability to uh, control opening the parachutes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Nick, you've been in business for a long time. Has, what kind of lessons has your work life taught you? Do the right thing always, even if nobody's watching, right? You know, you, you have the ability on you know, many times where you are either the sing single point or, you know, you, you've got responsibility for something and it would be easy not to do the right thing. You know, if you stop and say, okay, no, this, I'm going to stop doing what we're doing now and, and, and take a different direction or something, having the, the, um, the ability and the foresight to say, no, I've got to do the right thing even if people are not watching Particularly with things like the spin and store recovery systems, you know, there are very few people in the country that, that, that deal with these systems. So there's no real um, <coughs> knowledge base of saying, okay, you know, I can get an expert opinion from somewhere else. You're really the experts, and it's on your shoulders that that piece of equipment is going to either perform or not perform. And somebody's life is probably on the end of it. And if you don't take the right things, you won't be able to sleep at night. You know, and do the right things always, even if, even if nobody's going to check it or nobody's going to do it. Look out over it. You've got to do the right thing. That's most important. Tell us about your immediate family. I have two daughters, a wife and two daughters. Um, daughters are now grown up. Just left left school, uh, not married or anything, so no grandkids. But um, uh, eldest daughter is uh, looks. Uh, she lives close by. Uh, she works for a jewelry company, an internet-based jewelry company. Um, second daughter moved to New York and for college and stayed there. She's gone native, and <laughs> so uh, I don't expect to, her to come back to California again. So uh, is she out of school now? She's just out of school. She works for a government nonprofit and they're trying to improve the lives of people in Harlem. So she's mm -hmm. trying to. Uh, that's her uh, desires. Well, mm -hmm. tell us about what non-work lessons 
has life taught you? Make people smile. You know, <laughs> make people smile. You know, if ever and if ever I resign, for, you know, move on from doing the engineering business, I'm going to work at Disneyland. When I'm 70 or 80 years old, I'm going to be the guy person there at Disneyland, you know, smiling, making people laugh, you know, helping them doing things. So that's my, you know, my career path after I've finished engineering and is, to, is to keep active and keep smiling because I think that's really important. Seems so like your work and your uh, personal lives you've learned a lot of going through life what would you how would you advise a young engineer wanting to come into the parachute business I think two things really one a broad knowledge base you know learn as much as you can on different things and the second thing is learn to communicate you know we we find so many um, young graduates and new people to the business they are great engineers but they uh, have no ability to communicate you know they don't can't write you know, text, I guess everybody has PowerPoints these days, but there are days when you need, you need to sit and write a, a report. Somebody's going to have a report for posterity and or be able to communicate to management things that are going on. So communication tool is, is, is something that's really important that I think is lacking when people first come into industry. When we've got all the new graduates, you know, they're great engineers, you know, they've got all this engineering background, but they can't communicate what they're doing. Unless you can do that, you know, where is it going to go? You know, you've got to be able to communicate that information. So, you know, broad, broad experience base and the ability to communicate are probably the two main things that I, we were, you know, would recommend that people. Well, that, uh, thank you, Dick, uh, for that. Uh, we've covered a number of very specific uh, question type things. Have you? Is there anything we missed that you, you think might be important to say about the parachute business or life? You know, I think the parachute industry is is. is a small enough industry where everybody knows each other, um, but not too small that it so you know relies on one or two people. I think the camaraderie that you see in the that we've got at this point in time in the in the, uh, the in the parachute industry, both internationally and within the U.S., I think is is amazing. The fact that you know everybody knows everybody else, um, you know, and uh, and and we all there to work with each other. You know, we might compete some days, and we're helping each other the other days. It's not as though there's this. Uh, you know, a sort of you know, big, big company, big prime contractors. You know, um, you know, big battling it out. Everybody's here to help people, because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of our products, people's lives depend on them. And if we can help each other, then that's one of the things we should be doing. Thank you, Dick. Okay. It's been so great talking with you and uh, and getting your thoughts on things. The Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio tells the story of the development of the freefall parachute from its invention at Dayton's McCook Field after World War I through the vital role the parachute plays today in the decelerator industry and safely landing spacecraft. The museum includes interactive exhibits, artifacts, historic photographs, and films. Aviation Trail Incorporated has developed a self-guided tour of select aviation-related sites that are open to the public in the Dayton area. Aviation Trail's mission is to preserve and promote the Dayton area's unique aviation heritage, beginning with the invention of the airplane by Wilbur and Orville Wright. Find out more at aviationtrailinc.org.